Something which a lot of people tend to find quite shocking about me is that I'm actually a complete wimp when it comes to horror films. I just can't cope with the suspense of it. My heart beats out of my chest. I get all sweaty. It's just not for me. No, thank you. I'm not into horror films. I don't do true crime on the internet. I don't share these stories because I enjoy being scared by them. I do them as a form of advocate, I like to think of myself as. I just... I'm not a horror story girly. Even as a teenager when it was the done thing to do on a Friday night to go to Blockbuster and rent a scary movie to watch, I just couldn't do the horror. So to get around this, I found one kind of like thrillery movie that I could just about sit through. And then whenever somebody suggested a scary film, I would suggest the same one again and again. So I always knew what was coming. And that was 2006's When a Stranger Calls. When a Stranger Calls is described on the internet as a psychological horror thriller film directed by Simon West. And it's actually a remake of a 1979 horror film of the very same name, which quickly enough became a cult classic. Enough of a cult classic to be remade in 2006. Clearly the story that runs through these movies is one which resonates with people. It taps into people's worst fears with one iconic line that still gives me chills to this very day. The call is coming from inside the house. The premise of the film is something quite simple. A babysitter goes to, at least in the 2006 version of the film, a very fancy sort of cabin in the woods, glass wall style house to babysit some kids. Only when she's there, she starts to receive some funny phone calls and eventually she gets a call from the police telling her that the call is coming from inside the house. There is somebody in the house with her somebody who is not one of the kids that she is supposed to be babysitting. Many think that the inspiration for these movies stem from an urban legend, often referred to as the babysitter or the babysitter and the man upstairs. Every person who tells this story swears that their version of the story came from their uncle's cousin's friend or a girl they went to school with or somebody they used to work with. It's always somebody that they knew. This happened to somebody that they knew. Of course, that's what urban legends are. It likely didn't happen to somebody that they knew. But the urban legend goes as follows. So a girl called Jane was babysitting for the Miller family. The kids were already asleep upstairs when Jane arrived and the parents left for the evening. Jane sat at the kitchen table to do her homework when the phone rings. She answers to find somebody just heavy breathing on the other end of the line. Creeped out, Jane hangs up the phone and goes to the front door to check that it's locked, just in case, and it was. 15 minutes later, the man calls back again and he asks the same question, have you checked on the children? And this time Jane goes to go upstairs, but by this point she is so freaked out, she's too scared to climb the stairs. So instead she attempts to call the parents, she calls them several times, but she can't get a hold of them. So instead, Jane decides to call the operator with this legend coming from a time when telephone operators would act as the sort of middleman of a phone call, connecting the caller to where they need to be connected to. The operator tells Jane that she'll trace the calls, just wait a second, but when she comes back on the line, she says, get out of the house now. The calls are coming from inside the house. Jane manages to leave the house safely. The police then turn up and they go inside to investigate and they find the children dead upstairs. The caller was calling after killing the children. This was an urban legend with a lesson for teenage babysitters who are almost always female, of course. The lesson was, this is the cost of independence. This was designed to scare girls away from pursuing money, from pursuing independence from their parents. The legend coming from a very different time than 2023. But this was the urban legend. This was the thing that was said to inspire the movies. But like they often are, the legend was born out of truth most likely in the true story of Janet Christman. Seeing as Janet's case is now so old, taking place in 1950s, solid sources were quite hard to come by for this, but I've pieced together her story as best I can, mostly using about two newspaper articles from the Hutchison News from the time. 
Janet Christman was born on the 21st of March 1936, making her 13 years old on March 18th 1950 when this story takes place. She was due to turn 14 just three days later. She was a high school student with dark brown hair and a very busy social life. Janet lived with her family in Columbia, Missouri, a city that now has a population of over 126,000 people. But in 1950, it was much smaller with only 36,000 people. Although the city was actually growing at a huge rate, it had a massive boost in population over the previous decade. According to an article in the Columbia Daily Tribute by TJ Greeney, which is pretty much one of the only sources about this crime, so it is a pretty big source for this video, at this time, Columbia was a town where many doors were left unlocked. People knew each other's names. It was generally a very open and trusting community, something which would very soon change after Janet's death. No one in Colombia was really afraid of their neighbours, nothing much bad ever really happened, at least not for girls like Janet Christman. Her parents, Charles and Lula May, owned Ernie's Cafe and Steakhouse with a family living above the shop, but that's about all the information I can give you about Janet and her family. The night of the 18th of March 1950 was not a nice one in Colombia. Some may say it was pathetic fallacy. It was cold, windy and rainy and most of Janet's friends were going to an 8th grade party, but not Janet. She'd recently bought a burgundy suit for Easter and she needed to make the last payment, so she needed money, which just seems so mature for a 13 turning 14 year old girl, but maybe that says something about who Janet was. In order to make that last payment on her suit, Janet turned down the party to instead babysit for the Romax and their three-year-old son Greg, whilst his parents headed off to a card game at 7.50. The Romax were kind of like family friends, family acquaintances of the Crispins. They lived in a small one-story home on Stewart Road on the westernmost side of Columbia. Janet turned up on time that evening and Ed, the father, showed Janet how to load and fire his shotgun just in case there was any trouble and he instructed her to turn on the porch light before she opened the front door if anyone knocked, just so she could see who was out there. The fact that Ed felt the need to go through all this information does make me wonder if something had perhaps been going on, if maybe there was a reason for him to feel nervous about leaving a 13 year old girl alone in his house but maybe that was normal for the time, it was 1950. I don't know, maybe it's the Brit in me, but just the thought of showing a 13 year old girl how to use the shotgun in order to leave her alone to babysit might be a sign that maybe you shouldn't be leaving her alone to babysit, but maybe that's just me. I can only assume that this was indeed normal for the time because nothing in my research seemed to suggest that this was a red flag or any kind of warning sign, so maybe this was just what happened. Before they headed out to their card game, the Romax told Janet that Greg wouldn't cause her much trouble, he liked to sleep with the radio on and should just sleep straight through. It was going to be a very easy night for her. An article in the Hutchison News from this time reads, An excited girl or woman telephoned the police station about 11 o'clock Saturday night. Policeman Roy McCowan, who took the call, said she was so excited he couldn't understand her. And I assume that excited in this context doesn't mean what it would mean to us now. McCowan said, I urged her to calm down and just tell me where she was. Then there was silence. Not the sound of a receiver being hung up, just silence. Again, this was 1950, a time before mobile phones and caller ID. Seeing as this call was late at night and the test board at the local telephone company wasn't staffed, there was no way to trace this call and see where it came from. The officer just had to hope that this was a prank or the girl would call back, but she wouldn't. To this day, there's no actual confirmation that the caller was Janet, but with what happened next, it can probably be assumed that it was. A couple of sources do state that Mrs. Romack actually tried to call Janet to check in shortly after this point, but she just received a busy tone. The phone wasn't even ringing. The Romacks arrived back home around 1.35am and they found a very strange sight straight away. The Venetian blinds at the front of the house were wide open and the porch light was turned on. Both the front and back doors were unlocked despite their strict instructions to keep them locked. 
and one of the side windows had also been broken. From the outside, as evidenced by glass, that would later be found littering the carpet inside. By their piano, just a few feet away from the front door, they found Janet lying dead in a pool of blood. It was a horrific scene, and whatever had happened, Janet had clearly put up one hell of a fight. Blood was spread throughout the entire house. After rushing to check that her son was okay and finding that he had seemingly slept straight through and was completely safe and untouched, the Romax contacted the police. Janet was found with an electric iron cord twisted around her throat, with her scalp also having been pierced several times with an instrument similar to a small lead pipe. Her ultimate cause of death was strangulation, but the article from the Times says that her skull was basically crushed. It also uses the wording, brutally assaulted and then slain, which leads me to suggest, or leads me to think, I suppose, that she may have been sexually assaulted. Newspaper articles from this time around the 1950s will very rarely refer directly to sexual assault of any kind. Instead, they kind of just step around it. The Boone County Sheriff's Department were the ones with jurisdiction in this case, seeing as this was kind of like on the edge of the city. So they went in, they swept for forensics, and they found bloody fingerprints, and they found footprints in a sleep-covered area near the broken window. The sheriff, Glenn Powell, also brought in bloodhounds who tracked a trail from the home through underbrush to the corner of West Boulevard and West Ash Street, which is where the bloodhounds lost the scent. Is it possible that this is where a car was parked with the killer getting in and driving off? Quite quickly, when the Sheriff's Department investigation didn't really seem to go anywhere, the city police started to get involved as well. This was a pretty high-profile case in Columbia at this time. And this basically became two parallel investigations running. You had the Sheriff and the police, with lots of tension and miscommunication between the two. Dozens of potential suspects were interviewed by the police, including one student who wrongly confessed to the crime. But all of this happened without the knowledge of the sheriff. It was like two completely separate investigations, no communication whatsoever. Overall, the investigation never really seemed to go anywhere at all with either agency. In terms of what they did have with this investigation though, we know they potentially had fingerprints, they definitely had footprints, they had a potential point where the killer got into maybe a car. For a 1950s investigation lacking today's forensic tech, that was actually quite a lot of information. It was also noted that the telephone receiver had been improperly placed back on the phone, maybe after Janet made her call. It also seemed that the perpetrator had made an effort to stage this scene as maybe a robbery gone wrong, but for many reasons, investigators doubted that this is what had really happened. For example, the side window, that was definitely broken for sure. Glass was shattered all over the carpet inside the house, but when they inspected the window, it was quite clear that no one could have actually climbed through it without suffering some pretty serious injury to themselves. The jagged glass around the edges of the window frame would have caused some huge problems. And there were no traces of blood or torn fabric found on this window or on this glass. So this was actually ruled out as the killer's point of entry. The only reason this would have been broken from the outside is if somebody was trying to stage it. Which can only suggest that the killer entered through one of the unlocked doors, despite the Romax strict instructions to Janet to keep the doors locked. Was the killer someone Janet potentially knew? The door went off, she turned on the porch light as instructed, it was on when the Romax got home, she saw somebody she knew on the porch and therefore unlocked the front door, letting them in. Maybe the only reason for the back door also being unlocked is that the killer likely exited through the back door themselves, in case neighbours heard some sort of commotion going on at the Romax house and were nosily looking out through their blinds. He just went out through the back door, through the underbrush and that was that. So with the knowledge that this may well have been someone Janet knew, police and sheriff spoke to Janet's friends and family, finding one name repeated by her friends multiple times, and that was Robert Mueller. Mueller was an acquaintance of both the Romax and Janet's own family. He was 27 years old, and he'd made it quite clear that he had a crush on Janet. Yes, she was 13 years old. Yes, she was a child. Yes, he was more than twice her age. Apparently, that wasn't a deterrent. 
Janet wasn't interested, she was a child, but he didn't really care. Mueller would apparently make constant comments about Janet's figure, about how she was very well developed for her age, making suggestive comments about her to pretty much anyone who would listen. He made her very uncomfortable, she said as much to her friends, but what can a 13 year old girl do about this? It was just a man being a man, it was harmless, or was it? I wish I could say that Rob Mueller was just an outlier here, he was a creep, but I think it is actually a pretty universal female experience that you really do start to get the most attention from men around the ages of 12, 13, 14, when you're a young teenager, and that is just the very uncomfortable truth. Women, let me know in the comments down below if this is your experience as well, but I know personally that when I was a teenage girl, a young teenage girl walking to school in my uniform, I got the most male attention that I ever got in my entire life. Grown men driving past in their cars, wolf whistling, shouting things out the window. That happened more as a teenager in my school uniform than it's happened in the rest of my life. And I know I'm not the only person that happened to. Maybe that was a slight aside, but Janet certainly isn't the only 13 year old girl ever to be batting off the advances of a grown man. It's also said that Mrs. Romack felt uncomfortable around Mueller as well, that he'd run his hand across her dress just two days earlier when they were alone together. Mr. Ed Romack also said that Mueller had told him that he admired Janet's well-developed form. The Romacks testified that Mueller would have known Janet was there alone. Like I said, he was a mutual friend of both the Romacks and the Chrismans. He probably would have picked up that Janet was babysitting that night. And so Mueller was taken in by the sheriff for questioning on the 4th of May, where he was questioned all night long and then he agreed to do a lie detector test, which he actually passed with flying colours. We all know that lie detector tests aren't a 100% indication of guilt or not, it very much depends on your bodily reactions to stress. If you're good in stressful situations, if you don't get sweaty, if you don't let your heart rate rise, then you're gonna pass a lie detector whether you're guilty or not. I have a whole video about this. But most people aren't able to control things like that. Apparently Mueller at one point outright told the police, I might have done it and then forgotten it. But the sheriff never even had an arrest warrant out for Mueller, that was kind of it. He was questioned, he passed the polygraph and that was kind of where it ended. And so with this past polygraph test and no physical evidence at the scene linking Mueller, I can only assume the fingerprints were not a match. There wasn't much more that could be done. He was the only person of interest and he had to be let loose. Like I said, he did know Janet was alone there that night. How determined was he to maybe get his girl? But with no evidence, what could be done? He kind of had to be let go. But it has also been reported that Mueller tended to carry around with him a mechanical metal pencil that had this round punch end that may have actually been a match for the strange puncture wounds on Janet's head. They said the puncture wounds were most similar to that of a very small sort of lead pipe, but that wasn't exact. They didn't ever know entirely what this very strange imprint was. On May 24th, Judge W.M. Dinwiddle impaneled a grand jury to look into Mueller's potential involvement in this case, and it's at this point that the Romack's own statements about Mueller came out. On June 17th, though, the grand jury did not return an indictment against him, and instead told off the police and the sheriff's departments for refusing to work together. According to the aforementioned Columbia Tribune article, the jury report read, In the opinions of the grand jurors, much of the effort expended has been wasted and dissipated because of the failure to correlate the information available. Petty jealousies fueled an almost complete lack of cooperation between the various law enforcement agencies. Had the agencies been able to work together, could they have found solid answers in this case? I suppose we'll never know now. Soon after the grand jury failed to return an indictment, Mueller joined the Air Force and he left Columbia for good. And he actually later attempted to sue Sheriff Powell and two deputies for violating his civil rights during the questioning, but he lost that case. Mueller would die in 2006 at the age of 83. If he did have something to do with Janet's death, he never admitted to it. But Janet's case was not the only of its kind in this area at the time. 
Just a week before Janet's murder, a friend had been babysitting in the very same area when she received a knock at the door, seeing a strange man on the doorstep. The girl, Lois Terry, was creeped out immediately and she refused to answer the door. The story goes that several years later when Lois was married with kids of her own, she ran into an old friend from the neighbourhood. When the old friend introduced her husband, Lois recognised him immediately as the man she'd seen that night. She was convinced that this was the man who killed Janet one week later and had she opened the door, she would have been his first victim. It turns out that the bloodhounds that night actually tracked the scent to the home of this very man. Investigators thought that the trace ended at the road, assuming that somebody got into a car, but what if it actually ended at the house? He lived less than half a mile away from the crime scene. Nothing ever came of this though, and we don't even know this man's name today. In 1946, so just four years earlier, a girl called Mary Lou Jenkins would be killed just two blocks from the Romax house. She'd been strangled with an extension cord and a man called Floyd Cochran actually admitted to her murder, being sentenced to death in the gas chamber. He actually quite quickly recanted his confession, but he was a black man in the 1940s, nothing was going to stop his death penalty from happening. But I find myself wondering just how easily he confessed in the first place. Was he sort of coerced into a confession? Because then four years later, you've got Janet dying under very similar circumstances. I'm not entirely sure if Floyd Cochran had been put to death by the time Janet was murdered, but he certainly was in prison, so it definitely couldn't have been him. There was never any justice for Janet Chrisman. Sheriff Powell was convinced of Mueller's guilt until the day he died, but there just wasn't the evidence there, at least as far as they found. Over the years, Janet's story had been twisted into this cautionary tale for babysitters everywhere, a horror story inspiring numerous slasher movies where the babysitter becomes the number one target. It just goes to show that behind every story is an inkling of truth. Of course, Janet didn't receive a call from inside the house, but instead she received a call at the front door. Did the authorities focus too much on Robert Mueller, who whilst he was definitely a very creepy man being interested in a teenage girl half his age, maybe he wasn't a killer. Maybe they put all their attention on him and missed something very obvious. They missed who it really could have been. Or maybe it was him. We simply don't know. Had the two authorities, the police and the sheriff's department worked together, might they have been able to sort of combine their brain power, combine their resources and find more clues, more evidence? The answer, potentially, but again, we'll never know now. It's been 73 years and Janet's story has inspired so much over the years, but her killer has never been found. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you for spending this time with me and with Janet and with her story. And I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.